Hello and welcome to Dyslexia Explored. I'm Darius Nomderon, and today we're going to have a really interesting chat with young Josh, who is known as the dyslexic painter. And we're going to talk about being in the trades, working with your hands and school and what teachers say to you about being in the trades and all of that jazz. So, Josh, it's yeah. great to have you here on the show. Thanks, Dad. Great to find time with Darius. For me, the school days was just, in a nutshell, it could have been a write-off. Where I went to school, which is high school in Snevick, close to Birmingham, it wasn't exactly a high-class school. It was certain different, they're very, very diverse of people. And there was a lot of, some different issues going on in the school. I went to, personally went to a deaf assembly every year of my school because due to like either gang related violence or various different issues. But with my school, where I went, they, when I was in year seven, went to my first French class and they said, Rob, they pulled me out straight away, half an hour in. It's like, what's the point of you learning French when you don't know English, right? There was no real point to be learning a different language when I couldn't really understand English. But the things that I teach you in school when I went to school, uh, dyslexia was recently a new, uh, new thing in uh, a lot of people's eyes, but it was, it was before and it wasn't a fully disability when I went to school. And it, it, to be honest, I've reached a point in my life now where it's not a disability. It's more of a, if you see it in a certain way, you're just happy about it. I used to get bullied for my dyslexia a lot when I was in school, being an utter cast. And it wasn't until year nine where I started playing basketball because I was always very athletic. I was always good with my hands. And I was getting into trouble. I was getting into fights and stuff. And it wasn't until year nine where I had a teacher called Mr. Garrison. Mr. Garrison and Mr. Tatton, these are the people that it was like, role models that you're just trying to keep you out of trouble. And these just two lads. And I said, look, you're getting into trouble outside of school. You're getting into trouble inside of school. Uh, on a break time and a lunchtime and after school, you have to come to basketball. You have to, I went literally just went to the gym, played basketball, and it was brilliant. For me personally, it was brilliant. I remember, I'll always remember, on the Monday, I had PEPE, PE, science PEPE. PE. And that day was brilliant. It was absolutely amazing. I loved that day. And on the but on the Thursday, so you had two, three more days, and you brought minds, minds getting worked up, being dyslexia with ADHD and all, all the different type of things. Your mind's getting worked up all this time. And on the Thursday, I remember I had maths, English, science, and these was all quite far from each other. So you had to walk a bit, and it was always late. Which, Maths, English, science, double maths. And I remember when he was coming to the end of my like my GCSEs, it wasn't T levels back then, it was GCSEs. And my mind was about to explode. I couldn't do any more. If I couldn't cram more any more information if I tried. And I remember just going and I remember my teacher, my teacher saying, Mr. Mr. Tats, he said, next time you feel like that, instead of exploding, instead of letting it all in, just come and see me and we can talk about it. So I went and seen him and I remember him saying, all right, I was like, I can't, I remember knocking on his door and I said, I can't do it, man. I can't do it all over again in my mind because you have all this information coming in different ways. And realistically, in my own life since then, since like coming out of high school and getting more into the trades, I've got to say, I haven't used a single bit of it I haven't used maybe the roughness that the school provided from where it was, but I haven't used a single bit. And I remember Mr. Tapp saying, all right, we're going to go back to your lesson. And what we walked back to the lesson, I always thought he'd be, um, you know, he's just going to put me back in the class. And now he said to uh, the Josh, he's coming with me today, he's not feeling very well. And me, me, Mr. Tapp and Mr. Garrison, we went out onto the basketball courts for, half an hour, for, for the whole lesson. And honestly, mate, after that one hour, shooting some hoops I could have done the whole thing again I was on the brink of meltdown stage and then all of a sudden I had one area of basketball this might not help everyone this was just me and I just always loved sports and doing things with my hands 
went into the basketball courts and then I was I was fine. I could have done the whole day again from the start. So tell me, if you hadn't done that and you didn't have him helping you, what would be a blowout? Describe to us what oh, a blowout would be like. Oh, oh, when I was younger, I've got more control over it now. Well, a load of my friends will explain it to you. A load of my old friends. I, the slightest thing could annoy me. If you tap me on the head, I'd, I'd lash out. I'd be really angry, really aggressive. Would you punch them? Exciting. Would you hurt someone? Yeah, yeah. I, you, that, that was, it was kind of given where we was going to school because there was not a game too much into it. There was quite a bit of knife crime, quite a little bit of gang related stuff there. And you yeah, just needed to reach the point where I realised where, which it was quite good that I have the good parents that I have because I realised which path I was going down and I managed to just take a terrible left turn. Totally went the different way with it. You know, I remember at school, round about a similar time, I was like 14, and I was in the bottom set, and I was with the bad boys. And the teacher got me up and said, Darius, why are you with them? You're smart, you know? And I'm like, I don't think I'm that smart. And he's like, you really are smart, and I don't understand why you're getting the grades. I didn't know I had dyslexia at the time. He didn't know. But... How old were you then? Was that about 14, did you say, 13? I I was about about 14 to 15-ish. Yeah. Yeah. So what age did you find out that you had dyslexia? I I found out when I was about eight years old because when I was in private school, my mom and dad actually changed schools from where I was because they were saying, I was like, my son's not reading books. He can't, he's struggling to play. I used to have, I'd still got a little bit of a stutter, but I used to have way more of a stutter when I was younger. And I'd read in and write, and I couldn't really fathom it. I couldn't really get it. But on most of the time, I knew the information in my head, but I just couldn't get it from there to there, which is a lot of dyslexic people really struggle with. And with being now, being older, I like to now being in the job I'm in, I can. You don't need to put it from there to there. It goes from there to your hand to the wall, and then you, you, you're good. But yeah. when you, I was eight years old, when I first found out I was dyslexic, my mom and dad, it's funny enough, right where I'm sitting, because I've had an extension, they put, brought me out, sat me down on the back garden porch, and said, your son, you're, dys- you're dyslexic. We've had you tested. You didn't know you was getting tested. And you, you're severely dyslexic. And I was like, okay, so what does that mean? And there was like, you're going to struggle in certain aspects of your life. I was like, okay, so how do you do this thing? They always said I handled it really well. And for a lot of time after that, I was like neglected. Not neglected by my parents, but neglected by teachers and like other friends. Like from my age, from like when I found out I was eight years old to about 16, there was no speech recognition software. You had your dragon software, but that was really hard to to grasp and get your get the headset on and talk because you had to speak, read a whole book to get it speaking. There was no okay. I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna go do this, mate. Da, 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 da. There was none of that. There was literally just text. I remember the old Nokia texting. You know what I mean? Oh, and that was hard. always hard. that was terrible for me to yeah. grasp. Yeah, and I would do sometimes think if I was growing up in today's age. It would have all been different because well, I've always thought dyslexia is a, was a curse, as something to get rid of. And it's until you start looking at it in a separate way, in a way that it can benefit you. The simple matter of fact is, if you think something's going to harm you, if you plant bad roots in your mind, you, it's only going to have a be a roots. It's only going to ever give you badness in life. If you if you give yourself bad energy and bad drive to go do this it's only going to ever be bad for you but yeah. if you see it as a positive rather than a negative and it's look at the strengths you do have rather than the negatives so teachers in teachers in my high school always used to say to me you'd never be a banker you'd never be work you'd never be a doctor and i'm going to let you in on a little secret now Darren. i didn't want to do that I, didn't, I was too young to know, but they don't tell you, oh, you can work on a trade, you can be a bricklayer, you can be a carpenter, you can be a painter, you can be a plumber. They don't tell you you can do these these jobs, these manual labour jobs. 
that are hard to learn. Or as soon as you've got it, you you set for life. I could sell the house I bought. So I, I was 24 when I bought my house. I could sell my three bed house and move to Australia now and work as a painter and decorator in Australia. And I could move anywhere. I could move to Spain, Portugal, Uruguay. I could go anywhere in the world with the skills I have learned from painting and decorating because it's a very sort of after show. I, I remember you telling me your teachers uh, and them saying you couldn't earn a salary and stuff like that. And now you're earning yeah. way more than them. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm on like three times a matter when you've never had a minute, right? Because yeah, yeah, there was like, you'll never do this, you'll never do that. And now I remember one of the students, one of the teachers, saying, where, where do you live, sir? It was like, oh, I'll rent, rent a house. And I thought to myself, you don't own your own house. Like, what, what are you playing at? And obviously, the teachers' wives, they do deserve more, and maybe they'd get do better work. But the teachers that I had, I wasn't the best. And I know for a fact I'm earning double, if not triple, the amount of money that they are making at the current standpoint. So it's one of them. But the trades that you go in, no one really wants to do them. So what happened after school? So when did you leave school? How did that happen? You know, what, what was the transition yeah. from school to the, the real world like for you? So the transition was for me, right, is I, I realised a lot of my friends was going into, uh, coming up to 15, 16, there was going, a lot of my friends was going down certain paths in life. But I was cleared up enough to realise that I didn't want to go down them ways. My mum and dad always t- all told me, you can make money two ways. You can make money illegally, you can make money legally. And my dad told me, he's like, if you make it illegally, you'll get caught at some point and you'll be going to prison. Or you make money legally, it's hard, act, it's hard work, but it's rewarding when you get there. I'm like, okay, well, that's what I want to do. So I left high school and I went to a, a college outside of Birmingham. So it was basically a whole new start for me. Uh, totally reinvent myself. Something I think new and newer diverse people are really good at. Just, uh, I don't like that bit of me. I'm getting rid of it. I'm just moving away from it. And then I went to a college. I, I studied sports in college. I've still got my qualifications now. I've finished all my course. I got my level three in sports, sports coaching. Because what I really wanted to do in my life was teach the disabled children and people in wheelchairs. To teach them like back wheelchair basketball and blind football and loads of different stuff like that. That's what I really wanted to do. But it wasn't until I was 18, finished college, that I looked at the apprenticeships for that type of job. And you'd have to go to university and get the higher paid jobs. But it's a really morally rewarding job. But the job I went for, they offered £50 a week. For like I think it was about 30 hours in the main day. So I just turned 18, 50 pound a week. I was like, God, that's not what I was expecting. Because obviously being 18, you've just discovered bars, you've just discovered girls and growing up stuff like that. So you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, and then I had a, I had an offer. He was like, I was in the pub one night, one of my mates, and someone said to me, well, if you don't want to pay in the decorating course, I'll pay you £50 a day. So I was like, mm, okay, oh, I'll have a look at that. So then I went to college from 18 to 21. It was only one day a week because it was a solid apprenticeship. So you get, you get your CCS card, you get your asbestos awareness course. And with just them two things, you can work anywhere in the UK. And I think you could do that in like, you could, I could technically go to work in Canada because it's all the same, underneath the same roof, so to speak. But yeah, you just I went to work on a building site. And then I thought, in all honesty, man, I thought I knew everything. I thought, yeah, big I am. i coming out of college and I know what to do. You don't know nothing. Like, you don't, you're going onto a building site. I remember the days where I was working with a bloke named Gary. And Gary, I'm going to refer to him as Master Yoda for the rest of this. It's a thing because Master Yo, you know, everything to do with paint. Everything. There's certain people that I have learned off that they have forgot more than I will ever know in the paint and decorating. They've worked on factories, they've worked on units, worked on schools, hospitals. I've only done houses up to my career because that's where all the money is at the minute. 
like I've learned off Gary and then I remember one time when I was just coming out just going into the trade Gary sent me for a spirit ball and then tried to find a spirit ball couldn't find a spirit ball come back so I was like oh, I can't find it anyway I guess I was gone for about an hour he sent me to the site manager for a long wait and I didn't realise he was having me on at this point but this saw and then the site manager sent me to someone else for a long wait and then this 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 and literally I did a whole day of my life just walking to different trades, like the Sparkies, the Plumbers, to, to different. Everyone knew. Everyone knew. Everyone was in on it. And and so they I, asked I, you I, to I, get a long wait. Yeah, a long yeah. wait. Yeah. And that basically so went, was a long wait because you had the yeah. whole day waiting to find the long wait, which didn't no. exist. The whole day. I got paid for it. I got paid for it. But at the same time, he taught me a massive lesson in life that did. That one day of being on a building site has taught me more than school has done in the 10 or so years I had through primary school and secondary school. What did it teach it taught you? Me it taught me to ask questions. It taught me to, to know what you're doing, to, to not get taken for a, uh, a mug, so to speak. I said Masio to, to the site manager, to the chippers, to the plumbers. And then I never once asked, what is a long wait. Not once. Yes. Not once. Did, did I ever ask, what is the thing I am looking for? What is it used for? I never knew. And now, years later, I've done it to some apprentices myself. But that one lesson has taught me more than school ever did. Like the Pythagoras theory, in all due respects, in some industries, it's really good. But in the building industry, it's, it's not exactly needed. And I, I, like Henry VIII, I know he had seven wives, divorced, beheaded, beheaded, divorced, beheaded. I know that, but I didn't know what a long wait was. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it's all these different things that you can learn off building industries and building sites that are not sought after. And what's it? I mean, it's funny. Have you heard the joke about the lawyer who gets a uh, plumber out and the plumber does the work gives them the invoice and the lawyer looks at it and he goes oh my god that's more than i make and he goes yes mate that's why i gave up the law <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah that is very right uh, it's very true it's very yeah, true but... you know you know i i did a law degree okay and in the middle of the yeah. law degree okay i've got dyslexia in the middle of the law degree I give up after in the third year and I go to my mom and dad and I say, look, mom, dad, I know that you paid for my education. I know you want me to get the law degree. I just can't do it. I'm going to go and learn how to be a joiner. And they went, why? And I'm like, I want to work with my hands. I want to work with my brain and my hands and I want to make things and I want to know how to make, uh, build a house. And yeah. so I spent a year and a half learning how to build a house, did all my NVQs and all the rest of it, line drawing, brick laying, building stairs, building studs, plasterboarding, everything involved in machinery and so on. And I loved it. And it was like, it just fulfilled something inside of me. And then I was ready after a year and a half. I said, right, I'll go back to my law degree, just finish it. So I've got it in the bag and then I move on, which is what I did. Yeah. And Churchill got so depressed that he had to lay three courses of bricks every day to stop himself getting depressed. Even in Downing yeah. Street, he'd go out the back of Downing Street during the war and he'd have a yeah. bunch of bricks and he just used sand and water, no cement, sand and water, mix it up, lay a course, three courses of bricks. And then at the end of the day, at the end of it, he'd just kick it all down so it was ready for the next day and go back to his work. Brilliant. Because it's very rewarding. It's very rewarding working with your hands. I, I was working work last, last Saturday, Sunday, and me and one lad I was working with, we paid four houses in a week's time because obviously you've got drying times to think of when you're doing the one room. And then you look back at it and you think, they're good houses, they're good houses. Did you ever go, uh, did you ever do anything with a law degree or did you stay as a carpenter? Well, I ended up being a primary school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant, that is. <laughs> brilliant. 
That's no, class. But, no, but actually, it's so dyslexic, isn't it? So I did the law degree, I did the joinery, yeah. and then I, I trained as a primary school teacher. And then when I went to the primary school, I was also the woodwork teacher at the high school, uh, joined in with that, that school. And then when I finished that, I became a property investor. And I just, well, a property investor means you've got to understand the legals, the buying, the refurbishment, the building, everything. So all of my skills, you know, came into one place at that point for building up a property portfolio. Yeah. I bought my house uh, not too long ago, about two years, my first house. It's a three, three bedrooms. It's nice. I've painted it all, but that definitely added some value to it. In all honesty, like, I wish I never moved out. I wish I should stay at home. <laughs> I said to my mum and dad, I was like, Mom, Dad, can I not just like get a buy to let mortgage and I'll just rent out a house and I'll just do it. I'll, I'll do it up. I'll pay the mortgage on it. I'll rent it out. I'll get someone else to pay the mortgage on it. And I'll just stay here and live at home. And I was like, no. My mum was like, no chance. You're not doing that job. I was like, why? You, I'd have about seven houses in 20 years. And she'd be like, yeah, exactly. You'd have seven houses. You'd be 46 and you'd still live at home with your mom and dad. <laughs> I was like, sounds, sounds good to me. You know, <laughs> but they send me off. This podcast is sponsored by dyslexiaproductivitycoaching.com, which helps you organize yourself creatively with a productivity system for Apple devices. So what? I like to ask everyone is what do you think your main challenge has been from dyslexia? I say acceptance in myself, in, in my own being, not accepts that this is who I am in a certain aspect. Because you can you can try and deny it all day long. You can try and blame or oh, did this teacher didn't do good, this teacher didn't do good. But at the end of the day, I just don't understand it. I just don't understand the reading and writing side of life, literature and life. I've always said that if I could, if I had a time machine, I'd go back to the Middle Ages where there were swords and I'd be a blacksmith. And do you know what I mean? But it's just acceptance, really, being able to live with yourself. Because regardless of if you're neurodiverse or you're a normal person, there's some people that are millionaires that are sad because they're always chasing the next million. But if you're okay with your inner self, and happy getting up and going to work. I quite like getting up at six o'clock in the morning, driving to the building site, and having a having a laugh and a joke with the lads. Being a painter, you don't always work with people, but I go and see people at like the water cool laugh, like when I'm heating up my food, have a laugh and a joke with the grain workers, a bit of banter here and there. I quite like it. And to be honest, if you could say, if you could give me a magic pill that says, if you take this, you won't be dyslexic anymore. You could read. I wouldn't take it. I would not take it. Mate. I'm happy with who I am as a person. So how much can you read? Can you read? What What's your sort of reading level? When I left high school, I had a reading age of seven, when 12 years old, because it's obviously the months that you've been raised, been alive. And when I left high school, I was obviously like 16. I had a reading age of seven. Being like obviously in social media, the thing, you know, and obviously... Coming away from high school and having a bit of a social life, I can now, like, I can text, mate, what, what are you doing? Do you fancy going out? Do you want to go do this? Send them a link. The technology side of things with the phones and stuff, you've got a lot better because you can send voice notes. I'd say, and they, uh, I'd say I'm a bit, I could read to it like a 10 year, 10 out of 10 year, 10 old age range now. But right. I mean, unfortunately, I'm in an industry that you don't exactly need to. Yeah, and you've got this Instagram called the Dyslexic Painter. Tell us a little bit yeah. about how that came about. It, 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 the, my most follower is on TikTok. Oh, um, sorry, TikTok. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, my mate, who was funny, my mate Aaron West, my mate Aaron West, and he told me that he showed me that he can get paid from TikTok. And I was like, really? And he, he had a certain amount of followers. He had like ten k, and he get yeah, qualified for the. Craig's from, I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, it's not a lot, but it works. I was like, oh, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that. So I downloaded it, and I did a video of me rolling a wall with a song behind it. And that video got 26,000 views. I was like, oh, well, I might, I might be onto something now. And over time, it's developed into this thing where we're, 
my name was Josh Wilkins back then. But I kept on getting loads of comments about the spelling of my words, loads of comments. And my wife turned around to me and said, why don't you call yourself dyslexic painter? I thought, it's not a bad idea. So I did it. And then all of a sudden, everyone corrected me in my spelling. Stopped. You still get one or two every now and then, but you have your loyal followers that just say, mate, do you want? Do you know what I mean? Like, he's, he's dyslexic. And it's become more acceptable, and I'm so happy I did that because I wouldn't be in this position now speaking to you. It's that little key point in your life that can change you, just like yourself. Like, if you never went, Mom, Dad, I've got to go do carpentry, I'm going to go learn something, do something around. Imagine where your life would be if you kept on the loyal path. Yeah. It could, that little slightest decision can change your life in such a positive or negative direction. And it's just that little, little decision. That, that, that you, you don't, you walk past them every day and you just never know which, which where you're going to end up. And you just got to keep on doing it. And with the TikTok side of things, I've, re- I've reached a point with it where I see it as a second job. I have a quota I reach like half seven every single day, post a video. I have multiple drafts. I'm trying to set up different things, but my dyslexic painter is my main one. I've got to try to dis- uh, set up a VR headset one. Uh, that's a lot more editing, a lot more editing and like changing camera angles and all stuff like that, which obviously if you're just painting, you can just speed up or slow down and it's a bit easier with the, the painting content. But with the dyslexic game of content, it's harder to it's harder to get it all edited onto the screen, especially when you're recording portraits and you need it landscape. Yeah, that's something I've still got to get my head around. But yeah, it it will come in due time. It will come. Have in you due got time. yourself a Vision Pro? No, I've got a Quest Three headset. Right, I've got a Quest Three headset. But I, I, I was going to get, I looked at two, but I, I, the, the Quest 3 had more games that you could play on that I wanted to play. And when I, when I get a proper PC, you can connect it up and you can get mods and loads of different stuff for your, all your games that you play, which is something that's uh, an aspect for the future, I'm going to say. It's, it's something to deal with the future, that is. And I'm you looking know, forward to it. When we were at Dyslexia Show, you were telling me about some of your friends from school and where they are now. And you were talking about paths you took and didn't take, you know? And sometimes you can tell the paths you would have taken because other people made those choices that you didn't do and you can see where they've got to. Do you feel comfortable talking a bit about that? Yeah, mate. Well, in in the short term, most of my friends, well, from where I went to high school, there's been a couple of them that have escaped, but most of them, no, the other day they were in prison. It's, it's sad to say like that. Uh, there's a couple of them that was my friends, and one's went to America. Uh, I think he's doing well. One's got his own business in Birmingham. But the majority are either in prison, or I remember a mate, Kanisha, is passed away. He got shot in the back of a BMW, which could have been a certain aspect of people's lives. But you need, you need to make the right decisions. I think being able to get into the trades probably helped you get away from that kind of stuff as well, didn't it? Well, the thing is, mate, there's no direct route from high school. There is no, there is no one in high school in this day and age that is saying to, saying to young kids, i just like to sidetrack for a sec, mate. Uh, did you know uh, the UK government actually changed the law in uh, 2019. So in order, if you wanted to be a get on the building site, you have to have your C in maths and English. And for me, being neurodiverse, I would not have had a house at 24. I would not have had the lifestyle I live now if I never found the trade. And I didn't know I got my maths and C in English. So I basically, you've not got a maths C or English C, and if you right. went into the trade right now, you'd be locked out of the trade. I wouldn't even be allowed to be a labour group player. I oh wouldn't be allowed. Goodness. There's nothing. That's it's ridiculous. absolutely criminal. But, it is. But there's so many neurodiverse people out there that can learn, that can go to work, be a bricklayer, a carpenter, 
uh, painter, the plumber. You can be a load, you can be anything. And all it takes is learning off someone. Yes. And the UK government is condemning these kids, these neurodiverse kids, demanding that they have the maths and theory English, demanding that they get it to work before you even get your CCS card and go on the building train, which the CCS card is hard enough to get as it is. Like, it's, let's, it's, let's it's, take your scenario, right? If you were with those friends at school like that, and then yeah. you, your only chance was to get 50 quid a week with a different kind of job, and then you were blocked out of that offer of the painter, what would have happened then? I mean, you, you might have oh. started to say, right, well, I'll work on the side. I'll start doing a little bit more illegal stuff where you don't need to do all the paperwork, et cetera. Could you paint the, the picture of wh what that's forcing people towards? We've, it's forcing to be definitely forcing people towards crime. Definitely forcing towards crime. Because if I never found the painting and decorating industry and start to be successful and think, you know what? I can earn good money at this. And you might take some time to learn. I can turn some money than this. In all honesty, mate, I had a bloke say to me, I'll pay 200 quid, 200 quid to sit in that pub and to do some illegal stuff. 200 quid. And this guy was quite a dangerous guy. And I said, no. And he's like, you sure? It's 200 quid. I was like, no. I'm all right. I, I, at that point in my life, I was already painting. But without that painting, I don't know what I would have said. And it was good for me that I had a good mum and dad to push me in the right direction. But it was a very, very... It wasn't even a tough decision for me at that moment in life. I was like, no, nah, mate, I'm all good. I'm all good. You can, go, like, you can get me a pint now if you want. Drop it too, and you can get me a beer in that. And yeah. that, that's, that's how I responded. And he was like, <laughs> and last, you got me a beer in. Well, that's the trap that a lot of kids get, get into. A large, lot of kids get into it. Think, oh, yeah. So, and then you miss one payment, and then you're, you, you're hooked. It's a trap. It's yes. a trap that a lot of kids can get into because the UK government are saying you can't, you, if you don't have your maths in English, you, you've got to go get your maths. And they're like, no, nah, I'm done with school. And then I go out on the streets. Yeah. And that's that's the sad truth of it. But however, if they said, you ain't got your maths and in English, come to work on this building, sorry. Come to work with one of the big builders of the UK government, which they all, they're all in cahoots, they all work together. You could cure a lot of lives and put, put a lot of people on the right path in the right directions in life. And, and the great thing about that now is your AI proof. You're future proofed if you're yeah. doing it physically. You know, you're future proofed if you're a plumber, if you're a tiler, if you're a joiner, if you're a painter, you know, you're a roofer. You're future proofed because AI yeah. can't steal your job anytime soon. But that, and I, a robot and AI can do my job. Everyone's gone. Yes. There is no more work. Like the, the, the times that I can walk up scaffold or that moment in time, the food industry is gone, the taxi service industry is gone, and obviously the building industry is gone as well. But at that moment, in, when it gets to that level of technology, no, no one's working. Yeah, no yeah. one keeps that. You're definitely better off as a plumber than a lawyer because the lawyer, the AI is coming after the lawyer, but it's much harder to do the plumber's work yeah. or Tyler. The, the thing is, the, the work that we do on a child, it's not fun most, the majority of the time. The majority of the time, I mean, in the winter time, I've done mist coats where you, you put the first coat of paint on. No wind, the, the, some of the houses, there's no wind, is it? If the wind's blasting through, you're freezing cold, you're trying to spray the house, and you, you, it's miserable. And that's the reason why you get paid more, because... If I was a painter on minimum wage, you would not, you, you wouldn't do it. You, you just would not do it. There's, there's no time or no history that you do the industry that we, I'm in for minimum wage. You wouldn't put bricks on a wall for minimum wage outside in the rain. You wouldn't do it. Let's explore how dyslexia helps you as a painter, because I'm going to make a guess that your way of thinking although it's not very suited to school and reading and decoding, it is really helpful 
for the dynamic environment of the building site and so on. So, and some people might be surprised by that, but let's explore that a little bit about where your thinking and your way of thinking helps you in your work. So with, with painting, obviously it's different for all the trades, but with painting, there's a lot of drawing times. So as you, you got your filler, your cork, your paint. There's a lot of drawing times and a lot of prep work. Pe- people think painting's like, you go in paint, well, you do Yeah, you see, it's not like that. There's a lot, lot more, a lot more to it. It's, the actual finishing painting side, it's only about 30% of the work. But like, there's the majority of it. It's like, you, I'll go into a three-bedroom house I fill the frame sets, but they've all got nail holes in, call, call the, the, the woodwork. And then both of them things are drying. So if you use di- different types of fillers, there's some dries quicker than others, and obviously you've got the heating on, or if you've got the, if it's a hot sunny day, it dries quicker, it dries slower. If you ate in the wind, so it dries really slow. So sometimes it's better to do two houses at once. So you can fill and call, you can fill and call two houses. And then by the time you've done the second one, the first one's ready to go. Or you say if you've just got one house, you just fill in cork and then okay, that's drying now. So then you go around and cut all your ceiling lines in and then you roll the ceiling because it's not connecting to any woodwork. And then as soon as you've done that, then you can to, to realistically in three bedroom house, by the time you've cut filled and corked and you've got all your ceilings on, you'll you've got time then to start rubbing down the woodwork and give the woodwork a first coat of paint. And there's all these little things where you think in your mind that you could do it in a better way, a better, better system. And being dyslexic and neurodiverse person, you, it's better because you're just in the zone. You're just there working. You've got your own radio playing. You, you, you've got no one bothering you. Say, oh, have you got that report, right? Have you got, you've got some people, say, sometimes you're on when, the, when it's coming up to the CML dates on site, you've got to go do an odd job for someone here and there. But you can plan your day out. I'm my own boss, like I'm self-employed. I could go, if I didn't, I'm in work, I mean, I've chosen to work Saturday, Sunday, tomorrow, because I've obviously had today off. But if I didn't want to go in, I just wouldn't go in. I don't have to bring you on, I don't have to tell anyone, I just wouldn't go in. It's not, a, it's, do you know what I mean? It's, it's being, that's one of the best things about being neurodiverse and being dyslexia in the building industry. It's like you don't have to send emails, you don't have to text, you don't have to call people up. In the building industry, you have, you have that plot, you have, you have plot, plot one and plot two to do this week. So I'll go do it. But it is, the mental health side of it is a bit lonely because you don't really see many people. But I've reached a point in my life where I'm like, I don't really like people that much. Yeah, <laughs> to talk, go and talk loads to them. And sometimes when I'm talking, loads like constantly my brain just goes into meltdown and i'm just like oh did i want my space and but funny enough that's i could go to work and that could be my space i'm on my own i don't have to talk to anyone i don't have to do you know what I, mean? I, I could just be in my own book and just work i like when I walk into a space and I can see everything that needs to be done, I don't need to write down a list or whatever. I can just see what needs to be done. And then something clicks inside of my head where my brain is puzzling things out where I, other people are like, oh, wow, yeah, that makes sense. And I'm like, well, obviously I need to do this first, then I'll do that, then I'll do this. And then, oh, actually things have changed. And those people who are strictly strict s- s- process you got to do yeah. stage one, two, three, four, five. You know, they get their knickers in a twist when things go wrong. You just shift and adapt. You go, right, fine. That's taking longer than I thought. Fine. It's it's a colder day. It's still wet. Right. We'll adapt. We'll go and do this. And it just comes kind of naturally to it because our brains with dyslexia, ADHD are just this sort of zero yeah. gravity fluid space that's changing all the time anyway. So we're just like, yeah, no problem. We'll change. Yeah, it's, it, that's that's the thing. We've, in the industry, you've got you can. Well, I walk into a free bed house. I know exactly how I'm going to do it. I don't know exactly where I'm going to finish. But being on a building site, obviously, you can you can learn painting that right, like painting left right through private work. However, you can go like I can be on a building site with the numbers I have in my phone. I could build a house if I had the land and the property and the money. 
I could open my phone, I could bring some bricklayers, I could bring some scaffolders, I could get carpenters, plumbers, I could build a house on a piece of land with just using the contacts in my phone. I don't have to use it, I'd just bring them up and then sort out the materials and price the job and whatnot. And it's part of that, being, being on a building site, good because you still get to talk to people, you're not on your own constantly. And obviously, as you said, like, big, you do, to join, you as a joiner yourself, you, you walk in. And this is one of the biggest things I'm jealous to do about joiners and car- carpentry is you can go in and you can work. You can put, you, you can put, you get your joists on, you can get, you get your stairs in. And with most of the time, give or take, there's not exactly a lot of drying times. Like you got, you got glue to dry and stuff. But if you wanted to, you could totally go into a, to a, to one house and get it all finished in a day. If you yeah. wanted to, you, you, you it's it's incredibly hard. It'll be 14, 16 hour a day. But if you wanted to, you could. And yeah. that's the thing that I'm most jealous of carpenters for and like certain different trades. But with, with pain, you've got the drying times, you've got to think this, this, this. And if yeah. you try to rush it, it just, it just fails upon you over, over time. I remember yeah. the best trade. I think the best two trades, have, having been in the industry, I reckon, are carpet fitters and tilers. Because yeah. the carpet fitter gets to go in there and it looks like a bit of a shell. They put the carpet yeah. down, they get the instant sort of results and it's dry, it's fast, it, and they get paid really well as well. And it's so impressive. Like the owner is like, oh my goodness, that's fantastic. Yeah, it very makes, it makes, it makes a house at home, doesn't it? Yes. The carpet, and Tyler's, I actually thought if I were to go back, I would probably learn to be a Tyler because they're really manageable jobs. Like that's literally something you could do anywhere in the world and be at a bar yeah. and say, right, I'll tile your bathroom. And you're like, and it's kind of done in a couple of days, sort of thing. And it's a very high value impact and you know rather than and painters universal as well of course it is universal but if i was to go back and pick a different trade i'd would... mm. what would you say top five top five trades in order that for you if you were going back i'd, I'd say if i could i'd go back and start I love, I love painting. I love the industry. But I'd, I'd pick probably carpentry as the top one. And then I'll probably, I'll probably pick, pick tiling. As you said, it's like a universal. Like it's, you could go anywhere and so on. And the final one, I'd probably just go brick lane, to be fair. Because brick okay. lane, you got, you got a lot of, you've got a lot of people around you constantly. And if you just work with you, you can get a gang here and then work, graph. Yeah. Yeah, Brick Lane is quite social. So you've got Joiner, Tyler, Bricklayer. Yeah, Tyler is quite a lonely job because yeah. it's just you on your own in there. In it's been like painting in that industry. It's just like you, yeah. in order to make a decent amount of being a solid, you have to do it on your own. Yeah, because when yeah. you're a joiner and you're on a site, there's a lot happening round about you. You know, you're doing the first fix, you're putting up the studs, then the sparky comes in, you're doing something else at the same time, you know. Yeah plumbers then you go in and do the second fix and so there's quite a lot of dynamic yeah there's, there's pros and cons to every single trade that you do no matter what yeah. they're like you're a bit like you're working in the working in the elements the one thing you've got as an advantage I, i'm interested about the spray painting right so yeah. you don't on your videos a lot of them's the spraying of the rooms. And obviously these yeah. are new builds, aren't they? Because you don't have yeah. much furniture or even windows sometimes and so on. Talk to us about yeah. that transition from the roller to the sprayer. What, what was uh, that about? Uh, it's definitely added a couple of pounds on to it, for, for one. Um, so it used to be just roller. So you'd, you'd use like an 18, 15 inch sleeve and it'd be a long ply roller. So the roller, the roller ends used to be quite long, so it holds a lot more power, so you could stretch forever. So the mist carries years and years. Like paint decorating as a trade, it's been about since before 1945, and it always used to be things like you mix up your paint 50-50. If you put it through a sprayer as 
you're getting runs everywhere. I get a lot of comments on this all the time, and it's people that don't own a sprayer. And you're just getting runs all over. If you if you'd ever do it, I might actually do it with ones just to prove a point. You get runs everywhere. So the modern day paint is a lot more better than with plaster. Obviously, back going back uh, 10, go back 20 years or so. Do you ever notice a lot of paint, all the paint you are a bit loopy in the head? And that's because <laughs> that, that's, there, is a, there is a cause and effect reason for this. Is it because, the lead? Yeah, it's the lead in the paint. So, so a lot of it, do you know, it's modern day gloss or satin wood. It all, um, it will go yellow within two two years, like maximum two years in some cases. And that's because the the yet the lead, and they but go back even further. They used to put like asbestos and stuff and stuff in it into the paint to make it white. That's why if you look at like a Victorian house, it it's still most of it is still beautiful white. But if you look in the modern day house, it goes yellow. And that, that's the knock-on effects due to that. But the, with the spray that, you, there is, you can spray oil-based products on, but then you have to connect it to the ground wire because it oil-based is flammable and it could just blow up, which is something I have purposely avoided throughout my life. <laughs> uh, but we're going back to the miscoats, mate. Um, obviously, it used to be a roll of a bush. They used to have a strike out to do all the corners with. A striker was originally invented for, you know, metal staircases, the the nail pins. It was, the striker was originally vented, put a bit of paint around them, but it's widely used on mist coats and like putting in the first coat of plaster. What do you mean? What's um, a mist coat? A mist coat is when it's the first coat on the walls from, from bare plaster. Oh. So it's the first coat. It used to be, it was originally called mist coats because it was very misty. It, you could basically see through it. That's why it was a 50-50 mix. But as technology's got better, as modern paint has come out, like your Dulux, your, your Johnsons, your, your Crown, yeah, they're all suited to be a lot better, a lot more adhering to plaster. So I only do like 25 to 70 side paint mix now because back in the day, it was probably nearly to be 50 and 50, but in the so- modern day and age, it's so you doing it because everyone else, do all the other painters use the spray painting yeah. in these modern houses? Is that the way it's done now? Yeah, and, and everyone I've learned off. I'm on a, I'm on a firm with like 40 odd blokes. Everyone uses the same method. Not everyone has a sprayer because it is quite expensive. But in order for it to get pumped up for sprayer, it needs to be quite blue, bluey anyway because it needs to be, the abs to be pushed up put through. I mean, the sprayer that I use is a Graco uh, classic Graco sprayer. It's paired on the bulk batteries. And the, depending on what you're spraying, with on the mist coats, I use a 5170. So a little information there. The five, you dub, uh, the five is like one side of the fan. So you need to double it. So you've got 10 inches of fan. And the one is, the one is how much it's going up and down. And the seven is just a basic pump. So if you've got a, five, a 517, you've got 10 inches of fan to be pumped out. So you need to run the, that spray out about uh, 1,800 PSI, roughly. And is it faster we'll go, than a roller then? How much faster? Much, much faster. So on certain days, I could probably roll faster than the sprayer, but I couldn't roll fast and then cut it in after. Because you, because the roller doesn't get into all the corners. The oh, sprayer, that's the advantage of the yes, sprayer. It's in, cutting yeah, straight yeah. in at the same time. Yeah, yes, everywhere. Do you have to sort everywhere. of mask everything out and all that kind of jazz, um, like windows with, and all that? If I was on a private house, I would. But a lot of people don't understand that. You can see this from my comment section. But with the modern day windows, they, because they've only just been put in, they've all got tape around them. Yeah. They've all got tape the edges and they've all got plasticine on the actual windows. Sometimes you might get a bit on the edge, but I've got a glass scrape because you just scrape it off. And the part is it's like the, the, the actual house gets cleaned multiple times before they even move into the property. So there's a there's a lot to learn, but the, the actual control that you have on the this the sprayer is quite quite good. 
because I could spray, I could almost cut in a line with the sprayer, depending on what tip I have. Because if I have like a 3170, a very narrow wood tip, what I use to release, releasing, release the house is just releasing the corners on the main, on the main part of the plot. Oh, yeah. You can, you can get round and you, you can do it fairly quick, depending what the PSI level you are. But well, being this, being the near the verse, mate, it's brilliant to just go whack a machine and jump in a house thinking, yeah, I want to paint this whole house today. And this is, this is, and as soon as you paint this whole house, you can go home and that's 200 quid for the house, you know, so. And then I normally now go and find, try and find more work around the site because there's no way, there's always something to do. But if there's not, I often just go home about half 11 and it's brilliant. Working with working with your hands and working with two big tools. So, what advice would you give to parents listening to this who have got kids who are very good with their hands, maybe struggling with dyslexia at school? I'd say if I could give, I'm going to take that question and use it like, hey, what if if I could give myself a piece of advice? I'd say let them live their life. Like, if I don't do well in school. Then it doesn't matter if they want to like go up to stay on Xbox a bit later. Then let them stay on Xbox. For me, a lot of people would have disagreed with me, but for me, school—the only thing my personal school ever taught me was how to fight. That was it, basically. But obviously, going to building your shoe, it's quite good to have that in your in your back pocket. Not like you go around fighting everyone, but it, it's it's good to have a bit of muchness about you. But it, I'd say if there's, if there's kids that want to work with their hands, I'd say in the, if, if their dad's a carpenter or a bricklayer, uh, like take him to site one weekend and be like, I don't want to condemn people to painting houses the rest of their life, but if they they'll they'll find like like kids will find their own path in life, they'll find out what they want to do because they're all on this earth for a specific reason. And I'm not saying the path is setting. So staring for us, but it's a path that everyone must take their own path. So if your kids want to do a certain something and like go down a certain route in life, then they, they, they can, worst comes to worst, they can always be on the train. I've got three people that I work with that have advanced degrees. I've got one person that has advanced degree in business and he's painting houses because it's more money than doing more money and, and less stress. Traders, traders are always something to fall back on. It's criminal how the government, UK government, have the, the you've got to have your maths and C in English to get onto a building site. But there's, it's a dying industry. Like, in give it 10, I, I personally believe, in 10, 20 years, There'll be YouTubers out there saying, do you know what the new hack is? Become a plumber, become a painter. Are they on thousands? We're on thousands. All trades are on thousands as it is. There's a bit of diversity between the trades, but that's just a bit of banter. But in 10 years' time, like, I know people that have went to uni degrees, done six years at university. And fair play if you want to go into that career. But they're... they're They've got, they've got a job, part-time job at McDonald's and they're, they're a manager, ended up being a manager at McDonald's with this advanced degree. And it's like, why would you go through all that trouble to get to somewhere when, when you can? So I wish, I, I wish so bad that it, when I was in year nine, when I was like 14, 15, I wish the government just said, all right, go into the building site, go, go, go work with your hands, just go... Just go, go, go do some of your hands, learn about your trades. It's like I just you said, when you went to do your carpentry, you've done boarding, you've done a bit of everything. I've only ever got to do painting. And But if I had the opportunity to go back to when I was 14, I'd have bought a house when I was 20. Yeah. I'd have, yeah. Bought, I'd have, bought, I'd have bought a house. My apprenticeship would have been over at 16. It's only a two-year yeah. apprenticeship. Yeah. I'd have been painting houses at 17. Yeah. So I'd have been 17 years old. Well, near on front of grand a week and I'm like yeah same and then I suppose there's all something you're wild looking at you don't know what else you could have, could appear in life but at the same time money is a lot to do with everything we want to do if you if I wanted if I wanted to go to Brazil now 
I could literally grab my passport, go to the airport and book the next flight. I have that comfortable income where you can just go and do whatever you want at any time. You don't because you need to be responsible. You've got things to do. You need to keep the money going. But if I was going to give one piece of advice to parents, it's like if your kids go to work and your hands and your, your, your dad or your father's in the trade, then just take them to site. Take them to the site yeah. on a weekend. Uh, so yeah. just, like, then just take them to the building site. See, see what they would... See if I like it. I remember when I was younger, my dad took me, took to him, took me to a building site, and he put me in a digger. And I see, I wasn't working there. I was only like six, but I was work, I was working. And I kind of knew then I could have been in the, on a building site. And that's my biggest advice. If they're heading towards that way, then just let them go that way. It's a good job to do. You know, my mum was a property investor and developer and she basically bought a house did it up moved up and moved on and that was her way of dealing with it when she was a single mom and, and and making money but what she did with me was she said darius every time there's a tradesman in the house whether it's a sparky joiner plumber chimney sweep whatever you've got to sit right yeah. beside them and watch them yeah uh-huh. all the time and you got to talk to them. You got to yep. ask them questions. That's your job, okay? And when they came, she would say to them, "Look, here's the deal. You get the job, but my son's going to watch you do the job all the time. Are you okay with that?" And I'm like, "Yeah, no problem. Bring the kid." And that's that was my job. I would have to sit there for like two, three hours watching. I loved every minute of right. it. It was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you'll be you, people are still be surprised how much knowledge you can actually gain from just watching someone work. Because yes. I've, I've spoken to car, I, I, I know how to build a house on, on my own. I know how to dig for all the footings and do all, do all the work for it. And that's, there is no, I remember Master Yoda, Gary, say, said to me before, there is no stupid questions. There is only stupid answers. Because they're simple. It's like, why have you got that scaffold ball there and not there? Because we've only got three scaffold balls and we need to be safe here before we work over there. Silly question, but silly answer, isn't it? It's do you know what I mean? There's just way, there's loads of on, on building. It's no uh, silly questions, just silly answers. I just love silly that. answers. That's great. Yeah, that, that, that. It's words to live by. Yeah. It's words to live by. And I'm on the trade, on the trade as well. Another word to live by is lack of better work, mess around and find out. In other words, fuck around and find out. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes yeah. go wrong. Sometimes things go wrong. I remember the other day, me and my mate's car wouldn't start up. So we got, we went in his car, had a look at it. It was like, uh, I think it was the alternator in the end, but we was look, having a look at it. And it was like, mm. and we just, we just walked around and found out by it. And there's yeah. many ways, there's many things in life itself that is good at. Being on a building site, you learn off. You go, I know how to put a socket on, I know how to put a light in. I don't know how to do it. I probably could get my head around doing the first fix because I've seen it all happen like you, you know how to do each and every job and when as soon as you're in the type building industry for more than five years you you meet friends in there so not your friends that you see every single day but i could call us plus spark you know saying does, does this look safe to you can i touch this uh, do, do you know what i mean there, there is many yeah. many different ways that you can learn on a building site and of you- the older generation it's brilliant yeah. Do you think that you ask more questions than other people? I used to. I used to. I know the answers now, so I don't know. So the, my my form of when oh, I don't really ask silly questions anymore. As I said, there's no silly questions, only stupid answers. I don't really have any questions to ask. I've been in the trade for like 10 years plus now. So I don't really have any more questions to ask. I don't know what to do. If somebody, for example, if there's a patch on the ceiling, if there's a dirty mark on the ceiling, you think, okay, what is, where has that come from? Oh, it's from a leak. So we need some stain block and then we need to repaint it. But before you do, before you get both of them things, you mark each edge with a pen, pencil to see if it gets any bigger. Because if it gets any bigger, there's still a leak. And that's the cause effects. And that's every angle covered in, in one go by simply going, that, 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 that. So if it gets any bigger, 
Cork plumber, get him to come out. It's his, it's his messel. And then if they, if they if it's all been still there and it gets bigger, then you know you've got more of a problem because as soon as you've stained blocked it and repainted it, it won't come back through. Yeah, yeah. I've got a question, and that is sometimes I ask people if you could send a card back in time, okay, mm-hmm. and you take out the envelope and there's a picture on the front and a message on the front and there's a message on the inside back to yourself, okay, with a message, what point in time would you send it to? And what would it say on the front? And what would it say on the inside? So when would you send it to yourself? And what would you say to yourself? Well, I probably couldn't read it for starters, so that's a bit worse now. Uh, <laughs> no, what I'd, what, <laughs> what, I'd, what I'd put on the... So the front, I've, got front, I've got the front and the inside. Yeah. Okay. I'd probably just put, listen to your dad on the front and, and on the back, in, on, in the card, also listen to Master Yoda. That's, that's what I'd do. <laughs> That's Brilliant. for both. Listen to that. Listen to last year. That that would be my pros and cons, both of them, because they're both. They're, I've been. I've gone put on a path in the right direction. Because Fantastic. It, it will maybe work on the trade. Probably buy Bitcoin, lottery numbers, and all stuff like that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> other, yeah, other than just just buy, maybe buy Microsoft, you. buy Stop. Apple, buy Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, Disney, <laughs> Disney, box office, the lot. The last big Bitcoin, Ethereum, they're not mine. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, uh, that's what I'll do. Invest in Marvel movies. <laughs> that's, so what, uh, that's what. What would be your final? So you, actually, I was going to ask. You, you got ADHD as well. Yeah. When did you find out you had ADHD? In, in high school. In in high you know, in high school, I got diagnosed with ADHD. Because right. I've just always been bouncing off walls. I can never keep still. I've been moving around on this chair as it is. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. And do you well, take meds on and stuff started. like that? No, I don't take meds. I don't bother with them. I was, at one point in my life, I, I, got, I was told to take antidepressants. And I was like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. Because <laughs> I think it, 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 you always have a bad day or a good day. But that was quite quite some time ago. I'm a, I'm a happy boy now. <laughs> yeah. And basically, yeah. you're still following the same principle of get out onto the basketball court and let your yeah. energy do something productive. And you're doing that through painting. Yeah, pretty much, right? It's like you've got to get over there. And no matter what job or industry you go into, you've got to have a get up and go. You've got to get out be able to envision your day, envision what you want to do with it. It's like I'm working Saturday, Sunday, I'm going to have Monday. Come up to come back end of Monday, I've got I'm gonna have four bed and a three bed done. And you've got to have that wake up and go about yeah. Give you that's there's just people that go to go through high school and get their GP A level done, 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 bang, top grades. And they're like and they sit back and they're like, Yeah, that's me done there. It's not. You gotta keep on running. For, for people, some of them know not worse than dyslexia like me. You don't like you've spent your whole life trying to run and keep up with people that can read and write that are doing better than you in school. You you spend your whole life running until you keep up with them. And it wasn't until I bought my house where I looked back and I'm like, oh god, oh wait now they're over there. I'm about to go lap them. Uh, yeah, do, do you know what I mean? In life, like I said, there's some people that have from my college days. Not even that long ago, but. I haven't even got a car. I haven't finished uni. And I've got a car, a house, a fan. I've got all these stories things. Yeah, they're all bills. The car's paying off. But who pays the mortgage off on the 26th? They, they, they're all, I'm about, I've lapped certain people a couple of times. But you don't look back. You look at that guy in front and say, oh, what, I'm going to beat him next. I'm going to, and then I'm going to do this. For me, it's, you've just got to constantly try new things. So I'm going through TikTok, posting TikToks. So now I've got, you know, power through TikTok. So that's two sources of income. I've got other sources of income on the sides. But you just keep on working and pushing forward. And the only person that can ever stop you is you. The one piece of advice I'd love to give to anyone, the one piece of advice I'd, I'd say, if you could listen to any of this podcast, listen to this one bit from me. If you have a, don't involve anyone in your plan. No one. Not your, not your, 
you use the support, you use your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sister, your girlfriend, your wife. Uh, use everyone's support to help you, but don't involve no one in your plan. Because at the end of the day, you're the only one who can let you down. So I used to put my friends in the plan. I used to say, oh, yeah, when we get to this, we will, we'll do this and we'll, 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 be, we'll all be millionaires. And it doesn't work because if they don't do what they want to do, then they'll let you down. And then same, and, but if you'll be the only one in your plan, in your mindset, when, you're, when, I'm, going to be, when I'm going to be 30, I'll be here. When I'm going to be 40, I'll be here. My goal is when I'm 30, I'm going to have two houses, one renting out, one, one bought, one another mortgage buying. That's my own plan. But that plan might not work for someone else. It might be traveling, might be teaching, might be, might be many, many things. Well, have your own have your own goals and your own plans and your own ideals of how you're gonna get from here today. When I was younger, we used to when I was going out all the time with my mates, as you do when you were younger, we always used to say, What would you do if you if it, what would you do if you won the lottery, if you won hundred million? And it was always, oh, I'd buy you this Ferrari, I'd buy you this car. And it wasn't until one time where I was starting to get a bit bored of this, but I was like, okay, how am I gonna become a millionaire? where I want to be without winning the lottery. And that was when you've got to start thinking, okay, well, I've got these skills, I've got these skills, I'm good at this, I'm not good at this. And using your own skills to an advantage. And that's the best way, that's the best piece of advice I can give anyone. Because if you've got your own set of skills, for me, like obviously the sports and the basketball and football and the going through the sports side, it was always, you know, the school I'd end up on the trades, and you can always use your own abilities to your advantage. But we've, I'm quite lucky I'm dyslexic, if, if I'm being honest with you, because it could say a lot of things that you, you don't. You, you, all right. I'm not, I'm, that's, probably not, that's probably not for me. I'm going to go this way. So at least half of the modern age of making money, I'm like, okay, that's not for me. I'm going to go in this direction. And mm-hmm. I went full thoughts in that direction, full, full throttle, and I've went... I've ended up going down different routes on that same line. And that's, I think, the best way you can do it. You can go about things. It would just, just you got to live life and things still unfold along the way. And, and things get better and things get worse. And that's life. Josh, me... It's been fantastic to have you on your podcast and just have your, your uh, perspective. It's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I, do I, have a, I do feel like I haven't. Yeah. And I think it's been really helpful for parents and uh, other lawyers out there who might be thinking yeah. I need to change jobs. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think I think there's a bunch of people out there that are kind of like, you know, sometimes I have to say, sometimes I think to myself, do you know what? Because I do stained glass. I do mm. terrariums. I do joinery. I do so many different crafts if you give me something i can do it really well you know yeah and i thought to myself you really love doing crafts darius you know and doing stuff with your hand and there's a part of me that's like oh i'd love to just be a tiler and just go out there and tile people's and yeah. just have that the money the the quick money the straightforward business i can see exactly what i'm doing etc but do you know what i ended up doing instead was I thought to myself, app development is a bit like a craft, okay? It's a bit yeah. like building a house. You've got a digital foundation. You've got the digital walls. You've got the how you decorate the space inside of the app, et cetera. And, yeah. you know, it, it's building a thing. And if you think about the digital side, it's building a thing. And basically, the heart of oh. this podcast is enjoy building things making things fixing things and getting paid for it yeah that's the best thing if you, if you can provide a service to anyone in this day and age people will pay you for that service but you've got to give it all to that service if you want to start your own business you can do there's there's many things that you can do and all you got to do is you come in you could do drop shipping you could do many you could do loads of things in this world and it's just finding which ones to do. We're a bit spoiled for choice in this generation, I think. My generation definitely spoiled for choice of what we should do with our lives. It's interesting. You, When you're talking about your generation being spoiled for choice, 
you're a TikToker making money from TikTok as the dyslexic painter, and you're a painter, right? Now, yeah. kids might be thinking, right, I want to be a TikToker, I want to be a YouTuber, etc. What would you say to them where it's like, why don't you get a trade and do the TikTok at the same time as a side yeah. hustle? Is that kind of where you're at? Yeah, no, that's that's definitely a career that you can go down. I, I have I have many people on TikTok that right, are carpenters. They're then I'd be with mutual followers, reasonably on the same amount of followers. There's obviously other painters as well, but there's, there's bricklayers, everyone's all yeah, I can TikTok care and for this. But the what changes it is not how much you post in a week, it's how constantly you post. Because you can't just post one video a month and be like, yeah, that's that's it done. Because it's never gonna go anywhere. You need to be you need to be very, very persistent with all, all forms of, of all forms of create creating. You say so you just need to put it all through. Yeah. And you may mess around and find out mate, some things might work better than others. You might you can do anything in this day and age. Like yeah. I'm Oh, I've got my highest view video is 12.3 million and I'm painting. So you've got to think to yourself, if I can get 12.0 million views painting, then surely you can get 12.3 million views doing anything in the world. You can yeah. do anything. Work yeah. with steel, work with concrete. You could just pour pour steel on live, pour concrete on live shit, live streams if you, you know what I mean. Yeah. You can do anything. And then yeah. it's just starting that. We've got the, we're living in the generation that we have our, what the world at our fingertips at any given point. And you can learn anything through YouTube and t- t- different sources of it. So you don't, you might not have the qualifications, but if you wanted to learn how to board, you can just use this device and board your own house. There's the tool, it's all there for you to share. If you're young, whack it up. If you're starting an apprentice, just whack it on TikTok. He's an apprentice that's a painter that's, that follows me. And he's absolutely full of advice. And I was like, the biggest advice I can get is listen to whoever you're working with because the old people know the stuff. I don't want to call you call them old people, but there's lads that have woke up every day for the last 40 odd years that are coming into their early 50s, early 60s. They've been about, they know what to do. And you could probably teach them a thing or two about the modern industry with the phones and the internet and stuff. Like Master Yoda, he always texts me images through text. I was like, that's costing you like 20p a time, mate. Just use WhatsApp. It's next to next door to your messenger, your bloody granddad person. You know what I mean? And everybody starts to have a laughing and joking that you, know, you get to house on a building site when you reach a certain age and a certain quality with your work. Josh, thank you very much for joining us on Dyslexia Explored. Yeah. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, Max. It's been a pleasure. I'll see you again soon. I'll see you at the Dyslexic Show 2025. Yeah, yeah. See you then. This podcast is sponsored by DyslexiaProductivityCoaching.com. It's my day job when I'm not hosting this podcast. Tell me, do you know what you want to achieve in the workplace, but you're struggling with how to achieve it? Maybe you suspect some traits of dyslexia are getting in the way. Well, that's where dyslexia productivity coaching comes in because we give you a simple productivity system for your Apple devices that harnesses the creativity that comes with your dyslexia. It includes proven methods like note taking, reminders, speech to text, mind mapping and more, all tailored to your needs. It'll free up your time and help you achieve outstanding results. Book a complimentary call to discuss it with me, and if you do it soon, I may also be available to coach you personally via Zoom. So don't be shy. Go to dyslexiaproductivitycoaching.com or swipe up and book it now.